So hi everyone, uh, a very warm welcome to the fourth session of uh, CRJ's first online orientation course for college and university teachers. As you know by now, this course is funded by the Institute for Human Sciences, Vienna, and is a part of CRJ's ongoing program on migration and post-migration studies. It is also supported by the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, along with several other universities and institutions in India. So we are delighted to have Professor Mouli Vyas today with us. She is a long-standing friend of the CRG and has been a seminal part, as well as a faculty member in several of uh, CRG's workshops and conferences. We know her through the years. Uh, some of our very notable con contributions are uh, available at CRG's website. You can have a look. Uh, so, Professor Vyas is a professor at the Tata Institute of Social Science in the Center for Community Organization and Development Practices. She is also a board member of the Calcutta Research Group. She is also a member of the Board of Studies, Faculty of Social Work, MS University, Boroda. She has nearly three decades of teaching, research, field action, and training expertise in the areas of urban and rural community development, community organization, informal labor, post-disaster interventions, social accountability, social audit of government programs, and capacity building for corporate social responsibility initiatives. I have just named a few. She has worked extensively with grassroots organizations, government departments, corporates, and trade unions. She is also associated with the International Center for Development and Decent Work, which is a global consortium of universities. She has visited several in international universities as part of teaching and research collaborations. And this is really a very brief introduction of our body of work. So uh, over to Professor now. And once again, very happy to have you. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sucharita. Uh, uh, and many thanks to CRG and partner organizations for this opportunity to uh, uh, engage with this group and to talk about this topic. Uh, I'm uh, really glad to, I'm looking forward to this uh, interaction. I'll just uh, begin by sharing screen. Yeah, hello everybody. Uh, the, as you know, the broad topic for today's uh, session is on public health and sanitation workers. Uh, I was, uh, uh, I've just put down a, a tentative topic. It's more like points around which I'm going to talk, which is uh, migrant labor and work, sanitation workers, public health, and the pandemic. So uh, uh, I think uh, all of us uh, in India are uh, very, uh, well aware of the fact that uh, sanitation workers during the present pandemic have really come uh, center stage because uh, they have been hailed as frontline warriors and they are uh, they are part of the uh, the 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 band of uh, uh, people who are fighting the pandemic uh, you know uh, at the national level at local levels and uh, contributing in an everyday sense to through their work to uh, to tackling the pandemic. Uh, uh, this, uh, what I'm going to uh, talk about today is based on uh, earlier uh, research and field engagement uh, with the uh, uh, trade union of uh, sanitation workers. Uh, the work uh, has been uh, largely in Mumbai. Uh, I've also had the opportunity to look, uh, to study uh, issues of uh, sanitation workers uh, with a focus on, uh, actually more with a focus on labor uh, and the labor lens, but uh, also to look at uh, their work in terms of uh, insecurity, vulnerability, uh, death of workers, to look at uh, this as transit labor. This was part of a CRG project also, and uh, to work alongside a trade union on their issues. Uh, this is because uh, uh, in the discipline, uh, I mean, when teaching social work, we uh, you know, work closely with the civil society organizations. This has been one of the organizations that I've worked with. Uh, more recently, my colleague Manish Jha and I uh, you know, wrote a paper on uh, the 
public health, the sanitation workers and the pandemic uh, with a focus on Mumbai. And this is uh, the paper, I believe, Sucharita was telling me that it has been shared with you. It was published in the recent issue of Refugee Watch. So you have that paper. This, I mean, I'm going to talk around some of the points that are uh, detailed in the paper. We, uh, we started, uh, you know, uh, we started with uh, asking this question about uh, the sanitation workers, uh, you know, particularly having, having followed their concerns, their issues, and the process of unionizing over a couple of decades. When the pandemic came up, uh, the question that uh, arose for us was, has anything changed? Because when you uh, bring in a whole cadre of workers, thousands uh, and millions of workers from across the country, uh, center stage uh, as uh, frontline warriors, then uh, there is an expectation that um, uh, their work, their working conditions and uh, their overall uh, you know, uh, level of social protection would improve. So we started with asking this question that, okay, so now that they're contributing to tackling the pandemic, what has really changed for them? So in, uh, in studying their uh, situation um, over the past uh, one uh, year and more, uh, uh, we looked at uh, broadly uh, two lens. One was the labor, uh, you know, looking at them as workers, as labor and conditions of work and so on. The second was the public health angle. This is a new angle that uh, my colleague and I have actually looked at because we are not public health uh, people. This is the first time that we approached the issue with the focus on, uh, on public health. And we said, let's see what is happening in the city of Mumbai and why the condition is what it is, condition of sanitation workers. The third that I have mentioned here on this slide, uh, social work and organizing, this has been one of the one of the aspects that I have focused on in my work uh, on uh, you know sanitation workers, looking at how does one organize them? What are the challenges of urban organizing? And uh, because uh, when you look at the way forward, there is uh, actually there is it is an imperative that uh, uh, you know unorganized workers come together and they you know uh, work together to assert themselves to demand their rights and entitlements and improve their conditions. So, but organizing is not simple. And in today's uh, time, it is even more challenged for various reasons. So the third angle that I would look at is, uh, I'll touch on in, the, in this uh, session is uh, uh, of organizing workers. So there are these uh, components of today's lecture, sanitation work and labor policy, public health, and also the pandemic and the experience of the pandemic. So this is how I've broadly organized it. Um, I believe that uh, uh, a few of you are from outside India. I want to just set the context so that uh, uh, you know, we are on a bit of a common ground as we begin. So uh, sanitation workers uh, uh, in India, we know that uh, there are many sections of many categories of workers who work with waste in uh, urban centers in the cities, large cities, small cities. There are uh, thousands, uh, hundreds and thousands of uh, workers who do various kinds of work with waste. So it, it ranges from the waste pickers who uh, you know, pick up the waste from the uh, uh, street sides, from the streets, from the road sides, from dustbins, and also from landfills and then they segregate it, and then that's part of the entire recycling chain. They, uh, there are the, the sanitation workers who are part of the municipal corporation who, who keep the streets clean, who uh, clean public toilets in the cities and do related jobs. Also the, uh, the cleaning of the sewers in the, you know, the underground sewers. Uh, and there are the, the workers who, uh, who collect or who kind of uh, put together the, the waste from uh, different colonies, residential areas, uh, you know, commercial areas, and they load them onto the trucks. Uh, that These are municipal vehicles. And then they carry that waste. So they collect the waste and then they transport it to the landfill sites. And uh, 
in India, as we know, uh, the situation of uh, uh, the the processing of solid waste is still uh, not really. It is not really uh, very resolved in most cities. So, you know, how do you create uh, organic uh, uh, material, fertilizers, and so on? How do you process the the, the organic waste that we generate? Uh, this is uh, this is these are steps that still need to be taken in many of the cities. Some cities do have these uh, these processes and uh, uh, you know that industry in place. So there is the the garbage uh, collection and transportation workers. In in this talk, I'm going to focus on them. But uh, that is not to say that the issues of other groups are not very uh, significant. But this will just give you a glimpse of what is happening in the sector. And you know, you can, there is enough and more uh, literature and research on all of these groups. So, uh, urban centers and solid waste has largely, largely uh, is is largely an urban issue in India. Although that is not true anymore, because uh, more and more peri-urban areas and uh, small towns and rural areas are also generating. Uh, uh, increasing amounts of solid waste because consumption patterns are changing. And uh, as uh, income levels rise, I think it's particularly the middle classes that are, uh, that, you know, where consumption has increased in the past uh, few decades. So, so the quantum of waste generation is increasing across the country. Um, in Mumbai, uh, uh, the scale of uh, waste generation is really huge. Uh, in the paper, we have details of uh, how much waste is generated in a day. But I think 10,000 metric tons is one uh, figure. Uh, it's one figure that every day the city uh, generates this amount of uh, solid waste. It's known as municipal solid waste. And technically, that's also, it becomes like the property of the municipal corporation of the city. But, but that's the quantum of waste that we're talking about every day. Therefore, it needs to be uh, collected, transported, all, all of these processes become very significant in ensuring uh, a city, uh, you know, the management of the city and uh, public health uh, of the citizens. There are differences between the large and small cities. Uh, you find, uh, obviously, in terms of the quantum of uh, the waste that has to be, that is generated and that has to be managed, that differs. Uh, the number of workers are also uh, you know, that also differs. Mumbai has a very different scale of operation where solid waste management is concerned. So labor in this sector, and here I'm saying solid waste sector, is uh, migrant uh, labor. These are people who have, uh, in Mumbai, migrants over uh, several decades. And therefore, uh, in this uh, part of the informal economy, there's almost like a hierarchy of uh, uh, of work and uh, jobs uh, uh, and early migrants getting into more secure, if you know, I may use that term, but but less precarious type of work and the more recent arrivals who would be seeking uh, daily wage work uh, to work with waste. So uh, the the casual labor that uh, you know uh, comprises maybe people who have recently arrived in the city or. Uh, failed to find any kind of work or jobs, they will show up at the municipal ward office and they will, uh, you know, see if there's any absence of a regular worker, a standard worker, and, you know, they can be taken in on, on a daily wage basis on a particular day. So you have, therefore, in the municipal corporation, uh, the permanent workers or the standard workers, these are, these have uh, secure employment. So, uh, more decent wages, social security, and uh, you know, sick leave, paid leave, insurance—all uh, of this uh, uh, they have access to. They would have access to, and then you have the contract workers, and that's a large uh, chunk in Mumbai. And uh, then you also have uh, the casual workers, uh, the casual labor. Uh, it must be mentioned that uh, almost all workers who get into this work they are dalits. They you know, the uh, historically and socially, economically marginalized uh, communities in India. So uh, in what in government terms we say as scheduled caste, uh, you know, uh, populations, 
they are the people who get into this work so there is a there is an immense amount of stigma uh, associated with it and uh, uh, among the workers uh, you know most people if they would have had an option to do some other work they would have done that so it is it uh, working with waste collecting and transporting waste is something that uh, you would have got into because you did not have options and you know you did not have a choice so and the stigma is uh, uh, it's social in the sense that uh, society typically uh, spaces are closed for these workers so getting into a chai shop for a, a cup of tea is something that you know because of the stench that emanates from the body the workers would be told to just stay outside and not come into the tea shop they have experiences uh, of that kind uh, there is also a Uh, a, a subjective sense of uh, you know um, uh, stigma that exists among uh, many of the workers they would not for example have told the families back in the villages that uh, this is the work that they are doing so there's a uh, you know it, it something else is told to the to the people back home so probably that you know i'm doing the job of a driver or i'm doing some other work but they would not say that this is the work that they're doing There's several instances of this kind of uh, uh, you know um, uh, yeah conversations and uh, cover up as it were that uh, that uh, takes place so there is a question of identity and there's also a question of citizenship of uh, these uh, migrants uh, in the city it's very real because uh, uh it's uh, closely linked to the work that they're doing and um uh, citizenship uh, identity social identity citizenship in the sense of the absolute inadequacy of access to any of the uh, services or uh, uh you know programs of the state the difficulty with access the inability to access i'll be talking about this more as we go along and uh, uh therefore what i'm saying here is that in unpacking the experience of migration in india it's very crucial to look at work uh, because that really shapes the the experience that the migrants have in the destination or you know if you say in the city where they have migrated uh, and and arrived at uh, it's shaped significantly by their struggles with work uh, the connect with the place uh how much they feel a part of the city how much they feel uh you know just as if they're still on the periphery that is a lot to do with the the insecurity and the relative security that comes from the work there is also uh, uh this also gets transmitted to the next generation and uh, very often there could be a persistence of that insecurity if the household fails to make it because of this type of work so in a study that uh, some years back uh, uh, this was also a crg project but in a small study of uh, uh, sanitation workers who had lost their lives not necessarily at work but you know they they lost their lives uh, we looked at what happened with their uh, families and their spouses and their children and we found that there was a propensity for them to also get into uh, work with waste uh, you know for a number of reasons so so migration and work need to be uh, understood very closely together and i mean they 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 really shape uh, the work uh, context uh, significantly shapes the experience of migration in this case what i'm also going to talk about is the contract system we find that uh, these uh, solid waste or garbage collection and transportation workers are uh, other than the standard of permanent workers in every municipal corporation or authority uh, there's a significant number that is now on contract and um, this uh, may be in thousands or in hundreds depending on the size of the city but uh, the contract system has really arrived uh, in the sector i mean i shouldn't say has arrived it's now tw- two decades old but uh, almost since the year 2000 Uh, the entry of private uh, as they say players private uh, agencies into the solid waste management sector has actually been permitted so most of the workers who are now coming in are coming in uh, on contract and the contract system uh, it's uh, they are uh, they are governed by the contract labor regulation abolition act of 1970 but uh, there are several loopholes 
in the system which work to the disadvantage of the labor so so the so then uh, uh in this backdrop uh, here is the pandemic which uh, which has uh, uh which comes with a rhetoric and uh, possibly uh, an aim to uh, you know kind of acknowledge the frontline workers so uh, uh, they are really center stage because their work becomes more important than ever i mean if you didn't have the uh, the solid waste collection transportation workers or any of the other uh, you know workers working with waste in the city we can just imagine the uh, i mean the the response to uh, this public health crisis actually rests very strongly on the shoulders of the sanitation workers of course other than, i mean apart from the other uh, sections of frontline workers so uh, the pandemic arrives and uh, then uh, the workers are being uh, reorganized rules are being framed they are being administered very closely in the cities because work has to continue at a steady pace city cleaning uh, has to has to be you know kind of uh, good satisfactory and we have to ensure that the the deaths the cases we are able to control and battle the pandemic at least visibly it must appear to be so and uh, uh, yet we found that uh, some of the issues that uh, that started coming up and here i'm looking at newspaper reportage in uh, uh, papers you know that we were uh, reading of uh, which talked about sanitation workers from across the country uh, they talked about poor working conditions and wages so there is this you know what is happening uh, still poor working conditions and wages is a question and mumbai uh, by june 2020 had 61% of the cases and deaths i think uh, last year in 2020 mumbai was among the uh, you know uh, it had a really high number of uh, of uh, uh, of the cases the covid cases and the deaths so it was a, a, a crisis and uh, we all know about the visuals that we saw of migrant workers walking back from mumbai delhi and other large cities they just walked back and it's uh, uh, i think it's that visual which has been really stark and we know that uh, the conditions in which they left we know their travels on the journeys but it was all there for everyone to see thanks to social media and television and uh, and other reporting so uh, in this in 2020 the municipal corporation of greater mumbai was also challenged by the quantum of biomedical waste and in our paper we have we have given some statistics about uh, the the quantum and how it really exceeded the pre pandemic phase i mean by many times but uh, you have a system for managing solid waste but is it's not perhaps ready for a pandemic or does it need to be organized differently to respond to the pandemic is a question but so the quantum of biomedical waste increases and then the rules and the administration and the you know the whole uh, managing of the sanitation workers also uh, takes on a particular uh, tone and a particular agenda so the questions that we uh, we uh, began with was that you know the the main main question was why i mean why is it that things don't appear to have changed for the sanitation workers and we're still talking about poor working conditions poor wages and uh, there are many uh, youtube videos uh, put out by the unions they are they're telling you that you know uh, the uh, female workers getting lower wages than the male workers all of that i mean the 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 questions uh, they still continue and so we said why is it that shouldn't this part of it change when uh, you know uh, these people are these workers are so important and we started with uh, some questions started the exploration with some questions they're here on this slide i'll just quickly uh, go through uh, some of them so what are the lessons from the city's handling of pandemics and epidemics uh, because uh, mumbai has uh, experienced the 1897 uh, the plague and the 1918 spanish flu and uh, 
And here we are with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So what are the lessons we have learned so far? Uh, do they have implications for public health management, sanitation policy, and habitat of migrant labor? So uh, why are we uh, you know, managing labor the way we are? Why are the conditions what they are? Is there anything that's t- you know, that we can learn from the history of handling these pandemics? How has the history shaped policies and practice of public health? Uh, you know, the, what is the governance and management of informal settlements? Because all of these workers live in informal settlements, in slum settlements across the city. Uh, how, how, how are the concerns of hygiene, sanitation, uh, and uh, public health, so water and so on, how are they addressed there? What are the risks, threats, and vulnerabilities of workers during the pandemic? And we know that there is huge overcrowding in the slum. So this is a, uh, this is an issue with the present pandemic. So, um, you know, what is the, how do they manage the, with that? What are the, what are the, what are the concerns of public health and access to services for the migrants? How did these uh, sanitation workers uh, as residents and as workers, how did they, as residents of slums, and as workers, how did they deal with social distancing, sneezing, coughing, containment, physical injuries, illness, death? What really happened with them through these months? And what were the everyday experiences of migrants as residents and workers uh, about uh, access, alienation, refusal of healthcare and services? Tell us about the city's handling of the pandemic. So we started with these questions, but uh, we did not... Uh, uh, get into each one of them uh, uh, specifically. I think we have broad uh, answers to understanding what really has unfolded here. Uh, so it took us into three themes, uh, this exploration. One is the city's history of pandemic handling. The second is slum habitats and the public health question. And the sanitation worker as the as a pandemic warrior and the subject of public health. So, uh, we uh, continued this exploration with these three themes. I'm going to talk about each of them. So uh, the history of uh, pandemic uh, handling, uh, as I said, 1897 was, uh, you know, the plague uh, uh, hit Mumbai, uh, of course, Bombay at that time. And attention was drawn uh, to the risk to public health from the sordid housing and sanitation of the laboring class. And uh, the, really the focus came on the poor, deplorable conditions of uh, housing and sanitation. And uh, 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 400,000 people fled the city. So this is Mumbai, almost half of its population uh, fled the city. Uh, the railway stations were masses of humanity. This is what uh, records tell us. There were harsh measures taken by the city uh, uh, you know, um, authorities through survey control, attacking the bodies and the neighborhoods of the city's working poor. And the Bombay Improvement Trust, that's the BIT, it was formed to clear the city of insanitary areas to mitigate problems of the living conditions and to create sanitary dwellings. So the plague actually really brought the spotlight on the poor conditions of uh, housing and sanitation and so on. And the whole focus was on how do you, uh, you know, manage them, clean them, and uh, yes, and uh, uh, in order to deal with the plague. So uh, decisive actions by the municipal authorities in Bombay, uh, they included segregation, hospitalization of cases, uh, uh, regulating the municipal officers' right of entry into infected buildings. I mean, some of it is really uncanny in terms of what has been practiced this time cleansing and flushing out of drains and sewers. And um, health officers, sanitation workers, police, port authorities, all of these were vested with uh, with power to uh, check, to control, to, you know, quarantine ships and to, uh, to overall keep, uh, to monitor the situation. And they, it was, however, realized that demarcation and isolation uh, are not effective for epidemic control. It did not, did not uh, do the work that it was expected to. And the attention of uh, epidemiology but in, in, this, uh, in these years 
shifted to the slums and the polluting effects of early industries. And uh, uh, this was when the Epidemic Diseases Act of 1897 was brought in. And uh, uh, the poor migrant workers were seen as carriers of disease. So it was the, the, the body of the migrant worker and it was their habitat that became the focus of attacking the, uh, the, the pandemic, uh, the, yes, the disease. Movement was restricted, their homes were demolished and the bodies were subjected to medical experiments. So authoritarian measures were taken. Uh, the Spanish flu, a uh, 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 couple of decades later, also resulted in high mortality in Bombay. But it, one of the outcomes was that it created a new culture of social work and civic engagement. So there's uh, involvement of the residents of the city and the citizens in addressing and working alongside the city administration. Uh, it foregrounded the ideas of public housing, sanitation, hygiene, and related aspects of housing and health services. So this is what happened with both of these uh, pandemics in the city. And uh, uh, public health uh, really uh, came into focus uh, over the uh, decades after that uh, as an essential part of development infrastructure through provision of food safety, drinking, clean drinking water, uh, hygiene and sanitation, managing solid waste, etc. So uh, the focus did come on to public health. But of course, we, we saw with both of these pandemics, uh, which aspects of public health and what the lens was in dealing with the, the pandemic, the epidemics. So here, uh, with, with the public health question, uh, uh, in India, it's structural inequalities uh, that, uh, uh, that play a key role in access uh, to uh, services and public goods. And so the socially and economically marginalized sections are more impacted by the absence of these goods and services, and they also struggle to access them. Uh, through the colonial uh, period, uh, you had public health legislations the establishment of institutions and infrastructure to monitor and provide public health services. And uh, municipal governments hired their own staff to enforce sanitary regulations. So there were sanitary inspectors and others who were appointed to monitor uh, conditions uh, in different areas. Post-independence, uh, there has been a gradual atrophy of uh, public health institutions. And... Uh, and of public health. And I think we, we know why uh, this has happened, but it's the advent of the antibiotics, the curative technologies, which took the focus away from prevention into uh, the curative aspect. Uh, public health was medicalized. Uh, public health officials were replaced by doctors, uh, you know, to address the, the concerns and the epidemics. And a diversion of funds and resources from public health services. And also the, the, the federal and the state level uh, contributions that needed to be made. So uh, fiscal management changed. Some of this was not, uh, public health was not seen as very, uh, uh, you know, politically, uh, uh, you know, kind of populist. And so, uh, so it was sidelined uh, in terms of allocation of resources. And many of these changes took place. Uh, uh, these are detailed in our paper, so I'm not uh, talking about each of them. But the sanitary inspector's role receded into the background. And there was a gradual reduction also in the role of the state in ensuring public health and providing services. And this is the part that we are familiar with. It's happened in the last few decades. And uh, uh, more and more the entry also of uh, uh, private players in the health sector. Uh, informal settlements in cities like Mumbai, uh, there, there exists a differentiated citizenship. So you're treated as populations rather than as citizens. Uh, you're processed by the state uh, through the lens of uh, legality, property, which determine your access to public goods and services. For example, uh, living in a, a slum, uh, the question comes up about who owns the land of the slum. And so, uh, you know, whether it is 
state land, municipal authorities, state government or private land. And accordingly, you get access to clean drinking water and sanitation. And it is determined by the ownership of the land. And also in Mumbai, now we have the cutoff dates. So that also plays a role in uh, in uh, access, uh, determining access to these uh, public goods and services. And these are grossly inadequate. We have enough uh, studies and literature to show that people in slums are paying much more for drinking water than people middle classes pay on a monthly basis. And so the, the cost to surviving in the city is very high for uh, for uh, the working uh, populations, the working poor. Uh, sanitation workers, uh, uh, just to focus now on actually the issue of the sanitation workers. In uh, Mumbai, the Municipal Corporation of Greater Mumbai, um, uh, it is the solid waste management department that uh, manages uh, the city cleaning. And there are, as I mentioned earlier, there are different types of work in city cleaning. All of these workers are come under the solid waste management department. Uh, at present, I think uh, MCGM has almost 35,000 solid waste uh, uh, management workers. So they're the class four employees in the municipal corporation. These include uh, 6,500 contractual workers who are, so increasingly more and more workers are being taken in on contract and not uh, into the regular jobs because that's seen as a liability for uh, the organization. Uh, because of privatization uh, uh, from the year 2000, 2001, because of privatization, that's the entry of more and more private contractors and business firms and including international uh, firms uh, coming in to clean the cities. Uh, the employment is now in a hybrid format. So there are the permanent workers and the uh, contract and casual workers, both working alongside doing the same work and uh, in very different conditions. So wages and working conditions can differ for both sets of workers. There's a high degree of uh, insecurity and precarity in contractual employment because uh, you could be uh, asked to leave if uh, you, know, you kind of, uh, if the contractor is not satisfied with your work, if you try to organize, unionize, the first risk is to your job. And so uh, any kind of collectivizing or raising your voice or asking for your entitlements is, is a big risk. Uh, insecurity also in terms of uh, uh, no paid leave, uh, no sick leave, uh, no uh, uh, minimum wages, uh, which uh, were uh, you know assured by the Minimum Wages Act. Uh, now uh, you uh, most uh, workers, unless they are organized, they do not get the minimum wages. So the, there are all of these deficits and gaps in the access to entitlements. Uh, the pandemic also resulted in surveillance, segmentation, and control at the city level. And so uh, surveillance of uh, populations, because the disease is everywhere, nowhere, and yet it's only there where it is actually there. So there is a, a very interesting quote by Patton, which is there in our paper. But, uh, you know, they talk about uh, why surveillance has come in and why it's so important in addressing uh, and dealing with the pandemic. City spaces have been segmented uh, into containment zones, non-containment zones, and so on. So the, all the, the sorting out of city spaces, which continues still today in cities like Mumbai, uh, although the severity of the pandemic is not as it was in 2020. And controlling of the mobility of uh, populations uh, and, uh, of course, of the sanitation workers. It's uh, through various... Uh, uh, rules through various mechanisms and uh, officials who keep track of uh, and authorities who keep track of mobility and movement and restrict it. So uh, uh, yet uh, history also tells us that we have lessons to learn from the plague in Surat in the 1990s. This plague uh, and the management of it really raised the question that you have to address the insecurities of the workers. And that uh, the question of social stigma, because sanitation workers who are working with waste during a pandemic, it would be difficult for them to uh, go back home to their colonies. I mean, they are shunned. They are shunned uh, in non-pandemic times, and in the pandemic times, it's a they are they are kind of uh, 
uh, marginalized even more. So the plague in Surat actually uh, taught us that uh, this question of social stigma needs to be addressed through uh, awareness building and uh, uh, you know more of campaign type of work at the city level because uh, you do not want the workers to uh, sacrifice. Uh, uh, I, I mean, to not work in the interest of the city. So they should not uh, prioritize their own uh, interest over the interest of the city. They should continue to work in the interest of the city. And so do what is required so that we can manage this stigma that comes with the work that they're doing. Now, what happened specifically here in 2020, um, uh, I'm sure that uh, you have followed some of these this news uh, in your cities or in the country uh, during the last uh, uh, you know, one year. But uh, what we have done is we have uh, just highlighted a few of the experiences of the sanitation workers because uh, it just uh, uh, it tells us uh, uh, how the challenges continued through the months of the pandemic. So the first, uh, the local trains in Mumbai, and we all know that the local trains are very crucial in uh, for all commuters on uh, uh, in tra traveling the large distances in the city, given the length and breadth of the city, and the fact that a sanitation worker who who lives in the far eastern suburb of the city might be allocated work in the western suburb. So you know is uh, is having to travel uh, from one side of the city to the other and therefore local trains are the most efficient way of doing that. So local trains were, were, were shut in March 2020 and the uh, sanitation workers were told that they have to show up for work, that you know you cannot uh, take leave, you cannot be absent, you have to be there for work. So this uh, started the series of challenges that they faced because uh, they spent uh, uh, long hours commuting and finding modes of transport until I think uh, there was a decision taken to allow sanitation workers to use the local trains. So there was a period when they had no access to uh, the local trains and then they were doing buses and other modes of transport. Um, the pro protective gear is very, uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's an imperative for uh, all sanitation work. And uh, According to the Contract Labor Act, it's the municipal authorities who are supposed to provide protective gear. In normal times, uh, it is the raincoats, the boots, the, the caps, all of this, and you know the rod, all of this that the corporations typically provide. But uh, uh, here, uh, there, there were problems with the protective gear because it was, uh, it was the virus that was being combated. And the workers were anxious. They were they realized that they were sharing implements such as a metal basket, and they were afraid that uh, this could you know uh, spread infection. Uh, one of the incidents that caused a lot of concern was also um, that you know the personal protective equipment that they were given the the gear to wear uh, when it was given to the workers, they were told that uh, they should wash it. Uh, themselves. So maintaining the, the PPE kit is a responsibility of the worker and you have to show up each day with that PPE kit. But uh, given the size of the houses and the habitat uh, where they uh, you know, live, uh, the fact that water supply is not uh, adequate, there is no provision of soaps for all this. I mean, they were really concerned with how they were going to do that. And it was when the union raised this issue and argued about it that uh, uh, the, the corporation said that they would uh, take on the responsibility of washing the kids and then providing them to the workers. Uh, there, was a, there was fear about unsegregated biomedical waste that was coming from containment zones. And you have uh, uh, anecdotal evidence uh, from... Uh, people who were in the containment zone. So, you know, there are family members infected and so on. And they're saying that we don't know how to process this biomedical waste. So it's best that we hand it over to, you know, we're just putting it all in a bag and handing it over to the, uh, to the, uh, to the municipal uh, teams that come for collecting the waste. And the workers, sanitation workers are talking about how the bags of waste are being chucked from across the, Walls. I mean, nobody wants to touch it. Everybody wants to have minimal contact with it. So quickly dispose of it. 
but it's reaching uh, uh, the the sanitation workers in a in a in a hazardous way. Although biomedical uh, waste rules 2016 had laid out how the waste was to be segregated, but it didn't always, and uh, you know, this was not always done because people were not clear about how to do the segregation of the waste and did not want to deal with it more than necessary. So the control over the labor was necessary in order to deal with the bacteriological city. That's this, it just became a, a, a place of uh, uh, kind of uh, staying away from the virus, of uh, managing it by staying away and the whole responsibility uh, on some sections of the population to manage the waste. And uh, workers were told then that, you know, they were to come for work on a rotation basis. 50% of them have to report for work each day. So if a worker is going to uh, report for work on an every alternate day, the question that came up was, would they be paid for the days on which they were asked to stay away? And this was uh, one of the concerns that they had. I think this had to be negotiated again. Uh, so that they receive the wages. Because typically, if a worker is absent from work or does not turn up for work, then they don't get the wages for that day. Uh, there are cases of workers who were infected. One of them passed on the infection to uh, you know, their wife who died. The question is also, the question, the, the central concern is also, it's the work that's hazardous. It's also your living spaces that are hazardous. So this has proved really difficult for them to deal with. Uh, one of the workers who asked for sick leave was denied the sick leave and said, you know, told that you show up for work because you need all hands, uh, you know, to work. And uh, uh, this was at risk of life that workers have actually worked. So water, sanitation facilities at workplace, these are inadequate and they all have to be negotiated in the course of the pandemic. Now, uh, I'm just coming to the last part of my uh, uh, talk. So, you know, in, so the question was, why has this precarity persisted? And uh, in the, during the pandemic, uh, okay, so we try to understand that through the, through the history of, uh, of uh, pandemic handling and the public health, what's happening with public health at the national level and at the city level. That has in part answered uh, some of the questions that we started out with. But we found that in the, uh, in the course of the pandemic, four of the spaces, they, are, they seem very important and they've emerged as uh, very, uh, uh, they, need to, they need a closer look. And uh, the first is the policy space, that you have the policy space, here you see the Municipal Corporation of Greater Mumbai, the Central Pollution Control Board. These are framing the rules. They are also shaping the practice, but they are uh, these are the rules that actually apply for the residents and for the labor. And so, in 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 through these rules, uh, the state has extended its control and its uh, uh, its uh, it has managed uh, or tried to manage the pandemic. So, the policy space has uh, is is really crucial. The second we thought was actually the waste. The waste as an important uh, uh, discursive space, there is all the time the concern about how much waste there is, the quantum of waste, the nature of waste, biomedical, non-biomedical waste, and other waste. It's, it's the nature of waste that uh, you know, creates one of the problems because the Biomedical waste and the COVID, non-COVID waste, all of these have to be sorted and managed and so on. The third part of it is also the places. So you have the hospitals, you have the residential areas. All of these become very uh, uh, important in uh, how, you know, how they are managed because they generate different kinds of waste. So the waste as one of the spaces for tracking, for planning, for uh, you know, kind of uh, deploying labor in a particular direction. The third is the city segments. These are, and this is really uh, like breaking up the city into uh, containment zones, hospitals, non-containment zones, and so on. But these city segments, and we have all uh, uh, lived through uh, most of this uh, around us in our neighborhoods also, we know that there is fear 
there's caution, there's stigma, there's so much that accompanies uh, this whole uh, sorting out of the city and the segregation uh, and segmentation that has taken place. So uh, the mechanisms for handling the waste also depended on the city segment. So you know, each of these had to be uh, handled differently, each type of waste. And so it was a way of surveillance by the state of, you know, uh, surveilling the waste, surveilling the workers, surveilling the residents. But this is how uh, you manage it. You, you segment it, you kind of organize it in this way so that you can track it and you can monitor what is happening with the waste and the pandemic. And the fourth and very important uh, space is the body of the worker. Because uh, it is actually the body that is the closest in connection with the virus and the waste that contains the virus. And yet it cannot be seen, but in every day work, in every movement of the worker, if you see the way they handle the waste and they load it onto the truck, it's falling over their bodies uh, when they're loading it on the truck. But the body of the worker is quite central to this whole process of uh, managing the waste. So you have these four spaces. We thought that uh, you're looking at uh, Harvey's uh, uh, idea of uh, the space as non-neutral. It's, uh, it's created. It has a purpose. Uh, there's a certain kind of practice around the space. And uh, it is... Uh, uh, being used to control uh, the workers and the pandemic. And uh, this is also an uh, angle that we have written about in the conclusion, the last part of our paper. But uh, we thought that there is scope to actually look a little more, uh, look, look a little deeper into this. For example, uh, I think different cities may have had different kinds of practices in some respects. Smaller cities, larger cities, it might have been, the situation might have been different. But, but we can uh, look at the, uh, each of these spaces more closely. So how do you move forward, uh, uh, you know, as a member of the city, as a citizen of the city? How do you assert your, your right to the city and uh, tackle these everyday work and life issues? There is no alternative other than organizing or coming together or, uh, you know, kind of asserting uh, yourself and uh, making your work visible and so on. And uh, yet I found in the course of the last two decades, uh, you know, while my students have worked very closely with the trade unions and uh, at organizing the workers and, you know, we have supported through some advocacy initiatives also from our institute, uh, the, this work of organizing the sanitation workers. Uh, it is it is really very uh, uh, challenging, and there are newer and newer questions that keep coming up. Uh, uh, so, urban spaces and cities are not very uh, uh, simple uh, when you try to collectivize people because of the dispersal of the worker across the city. So, uh, uh, spatially, workers are dispersed. Uh, for each worker, the place of residence and the place of work is also, you know, uh, dispersed. But uh, workers in one part of the city very most often do not know that, you know, there are others who are in a similar condition as them. And so that kind of tying together and bonding and collectivizing, it really takes a lot of uh, time. And uh, uh, some of the unions have attempted this and been able to do it. But it's, it's really hard work because... Uh, you have to be able to move. And I remember uh, the, this initial phase of collectivizing where uh, our students had to also, they were also riding on the trucks with the workers because uh, when the workers would transport and do a one trip, the students would ride on the truck with them and they would uh, have conversations with them because otherwise they're not uh, stationary in one place at a, you know for very long. So they're on the move, you have to be on the move and you have to keep talking and convincing them and discussing with them and so on. So urban spaces are very dispersed. So that's a big challenge. The second is that, you know, migrants, by the, the, the whole plurality of the migration, uh, you know, the entry of migrants into cities, that itself uh, raises questions of uh, language, of cultural aspects. And uh, therefore, you're, uh, you know, if you're working with them, then you really need to have uh, people who know those languages and can get across 
to uh, different groups. So, you know, in Mumbai, for instance, there's a huge section of the contract workers who are from South South, uh, you know, Tamil Nadu uh, and also Karnataka. But then you need to know uh, the language so that you can reach out to them because they still don't, uh, most of them would not know Hindi and be very easy with communicating in other languages. So knowing language, understanding cultural aspects, this becomes pretty uh, important. Um, and I think this, the third point here, I'm saying really the obvious is that Organizing needs resources, it needs financial resources. And in the overall, the political economy of funding in the country today has ensured that certain types of work are really devoid of resources. So you, it is very difficult to find support for this type of work and certain kinds of work, uh, you, know, you can still get uh, support and you can build organizations around them. But so the struggle here is also a struggle of resources. And so uh, how much can people work as volunteers? They, you also, you know, if you're doing something full time, you need to be able to subsist. If, if this is your life's work, then you need resources, you need support so that you can continue doing it. Uh, the fourth point here, I uh, just wanted to mention that you know, it's basically deeply entrenched practices. I've not gone into it in this uh, presentation, but, but overall, the whole design of the contract system and the fact that the contractors are passing the responsibility to the municipal corporation and, and vice versa, but nobody wants to take the responsibility for uh, the workers. And they say it's the other, it's, it's the principal employer's responsibility and we are not the principal uh, employer the tendency to want to make uh, as much money as you can so if you want to even if it means that you don't give imp implements to the workers uh, if it's beyond the budget that could you know one can that's that's a practice i mean that that you will you will see that they're not giving the implements and that money is with the contractors but very often there's also a problem with the tendering process why, why cannot the, the authorities asking for tenders ensure that these conditions are met? So there is, there is this whole overall, uh, the framework within which the contract system operates, which works uh, really to the disadvantage of uh, unorganized sections of the labor. And this is one of the challenges that we have. So, so the pandemic has uh, really uh, done a good thing of bringing the contribution of this section of the workforce center stage. Uh, it has also highlighted the continued precarity of these workers. And I think there is a lot more that needs to be done. And uh, I hope that in, uh, you know, in, in a post pandemic world, uh, whenever that happens and whatever it looks like, that uh, uh, these basic issues and fundamental questions of uh, of labor are seriously addressed and looked into. Uh, I'll end here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we already have a few questions. So Kasturi has some comments. Uh, okay. Thank you, ma'am, for the wonderful presentation. And it was as clear as it could be. And I'm reading your paper as well. So there will be a lot of ideas which I shall get from there. So my thoughts are basically that, you know, this sounds like a vicious cycle uh, where I've written in the comment also that there it's it's all like circulating as, as if, you know, one leads to the other. And uh, sanitation workers here are seen, they, they are one of the category of informal workers where they seem to be living in a double-edged sword where they are victims of the pandemic uh, they are victims of being marginalized in the process, in the process, as well as in the politics. And they're also being projected by the authorities, as well as the people themselves, as the carriers of the virus, because they're also here, as we started off, they are the frontline workers. So that that is one of the thoughts which came in my mind. You can comment on that. And the question which I just posed related to that was, and I was it just there's a break in that, that while we are privatizing and contractualizing these services from time to time, you know, most of our public services are getting privatized. It is leading to more and more poor quality of services. Why? Uh, I mean, there are perhaps many reasons to it, but uh, issues like non-payment of wages and, uh, you know, not necessarily having a tracking system, uh, etc., whatever. But, and there's also a lack of motivation amongst the sanitation workers to carry on their work. 
but even if one didn't privatize it and subcontractualize it or contractualize it to this extent would the situation have been any better isn't it more about an idea of attitude or is it a matter of attitude towards sanitation as a work category and the disregard for the rights of the informal workers here as one gets gets these essential services at a much more subsidized level and often we don't realize you know how much it takes behind to do all this and whether union intervention then organizing the workers really is going to pay any returns to them thank you okay yeah uh, so would you want to take take it up or can i just read a few more and you can club them i think that's better so uh, shridhar guri asks uh, as these are internal migration within the boundary of india how do we document data because even state governments have no data of people entering to the states from others so is there any proposal being made to the government on creating such data bank and second is absence of such data monitoring mechanism whether it has hindered any policy framework uh then we have a question from uh, shudeep basu and he is asking should we be taking the necessarily disciplinary aspects of state control of the pandemic for granted since the fact of migrant workers indicates the moment where the state itself loses the power to manage populations and thereby health issues of non migrants i think uh, uh, kasturi uh, your your question about uh, uh, you know their life is a double edged sword and they seem to be living a life as a double edged sword so i i think uh, uh, yes if you look at it in terms of work and living conditions both there is there is a challenge in both of these and uh, there are difficulties in both of these uh, spaces in their everyday life uh at the same time uh, we have uh, examples uh, where uh, you know better working conditions and security of work for these uh, workers say uh, where uh, where they have gained permanency for example and uh, moved on to better wages and social security uh life has uh, improved so uh in terms of uh, housing in terms of education for uh, the children in terms of overall the way the household is organized things have improved so i think uh, i agree that yeah it it is challenging in both spaces at present but the way forward is to work towards uh, uh, there doesn't seem to be any other alternative we have to look at better working conditions and better wages and uh, more secure employment and as they say maybe formalizing the informal uh, through social security and other measures that that does seem seem to be necessary in order to address this uh, precarity that's there in both the places both the spaces uh, privatization uh, privatization i don't know you know when the argument for privatization was being made uh, if you see the reports i think they're still online there's a there was a study of class 1 cities in uh, india and uh, uh, this was in the year 1999 99 to 2000 and that report was brought out in 2000 and they they fa- they made a very strong argument we know what the argument should be i mean they were talking about efficiency and and better performance of the workers and all of that and uh, the the agenda and the uh, the logic it was it was pretty clear in in the report uh, of that committee which was set up in 99 um so i'm i'm not certain why you are saying poor quality of services because it seems to be a mixed uh, i've not uh, uh, I, i mean i've had the opportunity to study some cities in india and uh, private uh, players are functioning differently i mean the 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 results of their work and their performance it seems to be uh, it it seems to be a mixed uh, mixed one but i had I, i had done the study in 2007 uh, and we found that some of the private organizations and firms that were doing the uh, that had the contracts they were uh, doing a, a quite a, a good job because uh, uh, i mean they had put in place uh, very good systems in one of the cities we found that there was so much of an upgradation of the work and so much of uh, you know the whole working conditions the uniforms that they had given to the employees and the and the bicycles and the 
facilities at the at the workstation they had a, a reporting point you know which was a proper like look like an office and you know proper drinking water sanitation all that was provided now some of those uh, uh, those uh, models if one can call them that they seem to have worked well i'm not very sure how they are sustained and whether they continue to work the same way today but i think we would need a closer study of these private firms if we have to uh, make a, a very clear statement uh, i also uh, remember discussion about the international organizations of business firms that were taking contracts in india and uh, the question had come up that you know okay your firms are uh, registered overseas and 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 managed by people who are maybe sitting in other countries but the workers are the same they are the dalits they are the workers who live in the cities and i mean it's just that the owner of the firm is it's a different entity and hopefully then they are getting wages and decent working conditions but we don't know so i'm uh, uh, honestly i'm not very sure whether i can confidently make a, a remark about uh, about uh, private firms across the uh, across the country how it has worked i'm not very sure because i i, I know for a fact that it's not always work very well but the ways forward seems to be upgrading of the insecure workers and the contractual workers they definitely need better conditions of work so and that's that's the comment and uh, you know about uh, shri raj your question about the data bank of migrants i'm sure you will have more discussions on this during the course but there is a there is a whole uh, discussion about the importance of data and that we need data and uh, and that uh, i think some of the state governments have also said that they want to maintain a record of uh, uh, people from their states who are going out uh, for work so uh as an agenda of the state governments also possibly it may unfold we don't know but uh, uh, i remember reading about it sometime back uh, uh civil society organizations in cities like mumbai are some of them are talking about this because uh, not so much at the city levels we know that the data does not exist but particularly at neighborhood levels and local levels there is simply no record of people and the kind of work that they're doing and i mean there's no there's uh, if you have to reach out to them as we had to during the pandemic then there is no database and it, you really have to count on uh, you know local processes local activists and how things unfold at that point of time uh, in order to reach out to uh, migrant workers so it 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 is a it, it seems to be uh, a, a a good agenda um Uh, and we have to see how it actually unfolds because definitely there is a need for some kind of data to be created and managed and i suppose the best way would be to also have people's involvement and participation in these processes of data creation and management yeah uh sudeep hi i think uh, i know so uh, if if i if i have got you correct then uh, uh, yes then you are questioning the whole uh, the management uh, by the state because of uh, its uh, inadequacy in uh, in reaching and addressing the concerns of these populations right i suppose that's what you're saying so it is a uh, yeah but you know you with with the way uh, with the way uh, some sectors of uh, of uh, sub sectors are organized the 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 contact with the state is uh, it's it's almost a given so uh, uh, you you must work with uh, you must work with the state and the agencies of the state um, while you confront them so it's almost a it's a it's a it's a it's a real uh, dilemma but uh, uh, there doesn't seem to be any uh, any two ways about it at present because uh, the the need for social protection and the need for uh, the state to reach people is uh, it's still uh, i mean it is strong there is no alternative almost so people uh, and and workers uh, workers who are fighting at least with this section of workers whatever uh, you know uh, experience i have had i found that, that there is a resistance and an argument and every day struggle with the state but then still uh, uh, there is a need for it so because uh, no one else can uh, can uh, meet the basic 
violence and provide social protection. So I'll move on to the next question because there are quite a few. We have less time. So Sripanna Banerjee says uh, she has some observations that in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, migrant workers are being exposed to immediate and long-term harms to their physical as well as mental health. In terms of physical health, while some options are available, how to deal with the mental health aspect of the same due to the language, cultural aspect and the stigma attached to them? Uh, then uh, Bishodit Mohanty asks, if migrants are flows, do they have no agency in trans transforming political, social and economic life of city and of their life? So, um, so if migrants can be considered as flows, that's what he's asking. Flows. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I, uh, can I just, I'll respond to both of yeah, these. Yeah. 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 So, you know, uh, it's, uh, uh, in terms of uh, mental health uh, aspect uh, uh, of uh, migrant workers, I think, I mean, I, I really see hope in, uh, in civil society organizations because at the ground level, that depth of reach and the connect with, uh, with uh, migrants uh, is, is, uh, is most strong through civil society organizations, whether they are community-based groups, whether they are NGOs or whether they are trade unions or, uh, you know, uh, other kinds of organizations. But they are the ones who are uh, more closely connected with the, with the, with the uh, migrants in everyday life, irrespective of the issue they are working on. So, you know, whether you're looking, uh, working with them on, uh, on their labor rights, their rights as labor, whether you're working with a focus on health issues or on education, but it's these civil society organizations that have actually penetrated uh, neighborhoods and so to the to the local resident uh, of that neighborhood uh, you know it doesn't matter whether this organization is working only on health but if there's an issue of domestic violence or any other problem they, that person from that household would approach that organization and seek some assistance and then maybe get referred to someone else or another organization and so on but the presence is very crucial and uh, I think this is seen as one of the strengths of the of the voluntary sector uh, that uh, they have that kind of connect at the uh, grassroots level. So I I think uh, services. I mean that the comp the larger question is of uh, complementarity uh, in service provision between the state and the and the civil society organizations. And one may one may have differing views or ideological stances on this uh, question. But uh, uh, you, you do need a strong civil society presence so that it can address the issue. So there are services uh, and there are, uh, uh, you know, uh, helplines uh, and uh, voluntary organizations working with a focus on mental health issues. I suppose it's uh, also a matter of connecting to, uh, to these services. And uh, this uh, question of the agency of migrants, they do have agency. I mean, it's like saying the obvious, nobody is going to uh, deny the agency of migrants in, in making the city. It's, uh, uh, the question is, how and where does it get articulated and recognized? So we all know that you know, uh, any, any slum settlement, uh, if you see the history of a particular settlement, you will find that it was uninhabitable land those decades back when people came and settled there. And, and now, you know, the residents of that area will tell you that they made it and they made it uh, habitable. So people's own sense of the contribution that they're making to the city is one. But the other is also a more public recognition of uh, an acknowledgement of the fact that uh, you are making the city. And I think uh, we do fall short of that because uh, it's not backed up by uh, actions that give the same message. So why would you have to leave the city if you have made the city? You couldn't survive a week without your wages. Uh, and yet, you know, you have worked here for so many years. So, I mean, it's, it is, it is, a, it is a, a question that needs answering at different levels. Uh, so I shall request Nasrindi to raise her question now. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Shacharita. Morishi, that was a very exciting uh, talk for, you know, laying literally threadbare some of the, you know, points. Um, to be very honest, it's not my forte, but uh, 
I mean, I kind of want to have a conceptual understanding that I'm trying to build. So I want to just throw the question at you for, and that will help me unravel also. Um, I mean, in this entire discussion of migrants, um, do you see the possibility? I, I, I mean, I think there is there the possibility does exist, but just trying to figure out the question of you know citizen migrant and the evolution of citizen migrant who is being perpetually being contextualized within a particular frame. So being an internal migrant moving from point A to point B for livelihood has certain kind of structural, you know, exclusion that exists and living on the social margin, you know, also has certain kind of precarity. So I'm just off, I, I'm just wondering, you know, when we talk of, let's say the pandemic, you know, uh, which kind of happens very rarely, but now that we are facing it, do, do we kind of, you know, think more in terms of the pandemic because they were already in a very precarious state as citizen migrant. Yes. And the hyper precarity seem to be kind of obvious when, let's say, we want to transform them from that of a citizen migrant to what I call elsewhere as pandemic citizen. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm kind of clear on this, but I'm just wondering, you know, how do we conceptualize this in that sense? Because this is kind of ties up with partially what uh, Vishwajit was also trying to, you know, get at, um, uh, you know, dispossession, question of agency, yeah. and the question of dignified life. Yeah. yeah. In fact, uh, Nasreen, this also, uh, uh, it's also connected to the, the one of the key questions that we had started out with, which was about uh, uh, why is it that there still seems to be a status quo in right. terms of their condition? And therefore, do we need to argue for a, a different uh, uh, conceptualizing of of these migrant work as labor and as residents and citizens of the city. I, 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 I see the point that uh, you're getting at. I think uh, how does one work towards this and how do you conceptualize it is, uh, I, I really do think that it's uh, 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 substantively about uh, where does this, uh, where does this voice come from? Mm -hmm. And uh, unless, uh, unless, uh, uh, and also because uh, migrant groups in the city are, uh, are, are too disparate. I mean, I'm just using that word. It's, uh, they're too disparate to be treated as, a, uh, as a one set of migrants. So there's so much that is fragmenting them and that is uh, creating maybe different agendas for, for them. Uh, different challenges for them in the city that to also to construct them as one uh, one uh, one idea of uh, my of uh, of uh, of migrants uh, also seems to be uh, limiting uh, so i'm uh, so i think it would need to be a, a perhaps a calibrated look mm -hmm. at this because uh, there is the temporal angle. There is, I mean, you know, we, we still haven't addressed this whole issue of, uh, you know, when do you uh, technically uh, and definitionally we are all migrants or most of us are migrants. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. And we still haven't, uh, uh, we, we still haven't actually separated that line of the vulnerability and the precarity. We talk about uh, in, uh, in literature on migration, we are focusing on the precarious and the more vulnerable. But that definition question is one that's looming large, and mm -hmm. and the you know so so there itself there are two uh, levels of uh, the migrant experience, uh, but even within the precarious, I think that there is so much that uh, actually um, uh, uh, that separates their experiences. That uh, uh, how would one uh, build one agenda is a question, and would that agenda actually be towards social protection and recognition by the state. I and mean, would we look to the state for that or would we look to maybe uh, a different kind of an, uh, 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 you know, uh, imagination of that migrant is, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not very certain which direction it would go in because uh, the whole discourse on the right to the city is uh, basically, 
it spells out an agenda for uh, for migrants it, it's it's a useful one for migrants but then it has so many different meanings for all of these migrants so i mean i i don't want to give this as a very amorphous uh, response but i think uh, a, a no, calibrated no, no, no. understanding but with some uh, i i think uh, uh, i think the position of the state in this it just to me it seems like it should be there we cannot uh, reconceptualize or carve out an agenda without the state being somewhere uh, uh, responsible for it accountable to people and so on so i think that it has to be there in that uh, in that uh, imagination of the agenda for the future i'll just quickly read the last three questions um so joy kormakar uh, raises a few questions he's saying are the sanitize sanitation workers formally trained what is your opinion about the efficiency between government aided and contract worker do you think remuneration amount for sanitation worker is an uh, is sig- significant factor for others not joining or applying in this sector because if it is government jobs so many will apply for that position yeah so uh, sheik rafiqullah asks what percentage of sanitation workers come from outside the state of mumbai and also what is the percentage of the local sanitation workers have you ever found any kind of conflict between the local workers and those migrants are local are locals getting any kind of better treatment from that of migrants and then the last question comes from gulzina she says uh, was the situation better before the pandemic i mean sanitation and hygiene how can you imagine the future life if my uh, of migrant workers in this context okay okay so uh right so about the first question about uh, training uh i uh, at least the transportation and uh, the collection and transportation workers uh i don't think they receive any formal training for the work that they do but they obviously if if uh, i'm not talking about the drivers of the trucks but they need the license and so on but other than that there is there does not seem to be any specific training that uh, they go through uh, uh, that i am aware of um it seems to be work that is learned on the job and this is one of the features of the informal economy that the focus you know work may require skill but it is also seen as uh, unskilled work so definitionally categorized as unskilled work i mean who would think that uh, you know lifting waste from one place and putting it on a truck or something it does not really require a huge amount of skill and that's the first assessment that an outsider would make but there are finer details of the job that uh, that workers pick up uh, during the course of uh, uh, over the months and the years that they do the work but uh, formal training not that i know of uh, i i don't perhaps the private firms or some of the private firms may be doing some kind of training in terms of uh, interacting with the residents and you know the residents association members and so on but uh, uh, in the in the uh, uh, municipal uh, uh, authorities the solid waste management department uh i don't think they go through any formal training uh, uh of course if you are if you are doing the work of going underground into the sewer we are not talking about that section of workers but i think they are given some tips on uh you know how to wear the mask and to go down and i, I think there is some level of induction or orientation that may be taking place there in terms of performance of the standard and the non standard workers see you know there's there is this whole a larger uh, view and a discourse that you know if you have security of employment and if you have a permanent job then you are going to be uh, casual about it meaning that you know then you're not uh, so much focused on your performance and on uh, delivering a very good service you could have a casual approach to your work but it is a it is one uh, you know level of discussion and one discourse and one point of view and i am not subscribing to that uh, uh right now but a uh, difference between private and uh, the the municipal permanent workers i would say that i think that the surveillance and monitoring over the contact workers is pretty high because uh, even if you look at the street cleaning work that happens in all the cities for uh, you know a particular kilo, one or two kilometer stretches that are given to all the each of the workers there 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 are regular visits by uh, supervisors to see whether the work has been done or not and if after you have swept a stretch stretch of the sea, uh, street 
if there's a uh, some more kachra or some more dirt lying there you have to go back i mean it is pointed out to you and you have to go back and you have to sweep it again so there is that kind of uh, monitoring and tracking that seems to uh, take place with the contract workers but so therefore performance i am sure that with contractual workers it's it it would be good because uh, the risk of losing the job is for any uh, reason it's it's very high um the uh, what was the third one the remuneration and the fact that it's government job yeah yes you know for uh, in in some of the i uh, in some cities uh, i have read that uh, because it's a municipal uh, corporation job uh, although it's a class 4 uh, job um, and uh, not many people want to do this kind of work but it also comes with housing and some uh, facilities from the state so there are instances where uh, where the children of the sanitation workers who are permanent they have gone into this work and taken up the job in spite of having a higher uh, level of formal education and maybe other options that they could explore but they have gotten to do the same job as the parent because then they will have access to that same house and they will not have to give it up so there are different dynamics at work in this kind of decision and yes secure job does seem to be uh, i mean it does seem to play an important role but even then i think uh, the question it's it's uh, not something that uh, one would approach if you had alternatives and if you had options so uh, that is uh, yeah about that um in mumbai the percentage of uh, see so maharashtra and uh, uh, the south if you see i i don't know i i would my hunch is it but uh, I, I, my apologies i don't have the exact figures but i think it you know at the time when the union building was happening and you know a decade or more back it it seemed to be equal numbers one side of the city the western suburbs had large numbers of people from the south migrant workers from the south and it's the central and the eastern suburbs that had a large number of migrants from within maharashtra so it 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 really in terms of numbers they were fairly even uh sucharita the question about before the pandemic what was the yeah so have you ever found any any kind of conflict between the local workers and those migrants are locals getting any kind of better treatment from that of migrants i i have not uh, come across those instances or in the space in which i have uh, associated with the uh, the union and the collectives this issue has not so much come up so uh, but that's my uh, my experience I, i i don't really know but you know uh, uh, this uh, the work is pretty organized in a in in a certain way so if you have the job if you are employed by the contractor then you are doing the job so i don't think that there is space for uh, that kind of conflict to come in between you know contract workers there could possibly be conflict between casual workers who are competing for the job on a daily basis so at the chauki or at the ward office when people turn up and say that okay is there work for me that's where there could be arguments there could be discussion there could be competition for the work for that day but i think uh, the contract workers because they're there for some months they their work would be organized and planned and allocated in a pretty systematic way so yeah but uh, the larger uh, environment in the city and the larger question of the insider outsider those dynamics uh, would exist but i have not come across them in this uh, respect and i think that an important role has been played by the unions in this regard because then you know you it is not uh, it is it is more the class based organizing that takes place rather than uh, your identity as a uh, you know in terms of region or in terms of maybe caste uh, and the last question was about uh, the situation before the pandemic was it better um better for the workers or better for the city uh, and the, and the residents other residents what do you mean sanitation and hygiene um i think she what she is meaning is whether the situation of sanitation and hygiene uh, slightly better and also my about the situation of migrant workers i will and also come in for a second kulzinas from kyrgyzstan so our context may not be yeah. as evident to her as uh, it is to the rest of us okay so uh uh 
it appears but uh, i'm i i have not uh, uh, i've not kind of read about this or studied this but it appears as if uh, solid waste is more uh, more uh, uh, is better managed now uh, in the pandemic and post the pandemic and also i think uh, residents are also taking responsibility in a clearer way so uh, and and taking more responsibility so being careful trying to segregate i think in some of the cities like uh, mumbai or maybe parts of mumbai this is something that is taking place they may have been casual about it earlier but now at least there seems to have been some kind of change that is taking place uh, in terms of the condition of the workers uh, uh, i think that this needs to be uh, looked into uh, to make a you know very confident uh, and clear response but uh, it appears uh, think that their issues are being addressed because all of the illustrations that i gave when these questions were raised there was a response from the municipal authority so they have looked into those issues but the 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 still during the pandemic uh, the uh, the sanitation workers uh, in the month of i think september or october last year they made a human chain in one part of the city to raise awareness about their concerns so my hunch is that it's an ongoing battle um so uh, thank you molishri did i mean this was an excellent uh, elaborative detailed talk so uh, shomota did do you want to come in oh, okay so it's a wrap then so i want to again thank you and thank all our participants for their uh, questions and comments and of course uh, my colleagues at crg shomota did and everyone who helped in this and uh, not to forget our funders who have been very kindly supporting us so thank you very much thank you so much uh, thanks to uh, you sucharita thanks to crg shamata many thanks uh, for uh, uh, you know giving me this opportunity all of you uh, i uh, uh, for the participants i just want to say that uh, it is uh, this is a limitation of this online space i just wish that uh, we could have interacted and met and discussed and so um, uh, do excuse any uh, Uh, inadequate responses i just there's just uh, no scope for follow up <laughs> immediately otherwise one would have had a, a cup of tea and talked outside the uh, outside the classroom but but uh, i hope that uh, your questions have been addressed and thank you so much yeah thanks thank you thank you